In this video, I'd like to discuss the concept of orbital interactions. But before I get into what an orbital interaction is, I want to tell you a little bit about why they're useful and why specifically they'll be useful for us. So, so far I've alluded to, and throughout the semester we'll continue to use, this idea of localized MO theory. The notion that we can take the bonds and lone pairs of Lewis structures and map those directly onto molecular orbitals with standardized shapes and energies. But a problem arises when you realize that many orbitals span three or more atoms by their nature, and these can't be adequately explained by localized MO theory alone. Instead, what we need is a way to couple localized MOs to one another, and orbital interactions provide that conceptual framework. Armed with localized MO theory and the orbital interactions idea, we can begin to think about delocalized MOs that span multiple atoms as involving interactions between localized molecular orbitals. Mathematically, we've actually already seen the orbital interactions concept in action in the context of the LCAO method. So the way the LCAO method works is that an MO is equal to some linear combination of the atomic orbitals, say AO1 plus AO2 plus AO3. And we discussed how these plus or minus signs if the coefficient is negative involve the merging together or the canceling out of orbital lobes. And you can imagine this operation of addition or subtraction as a kind of orbital interaction in and of itself. You'll see that when we generalize this to two arbitrary orbitals, a very basic orbital interaction involves addition and subtraction of the interacting molecular orbitals to produce two new molecular orbitals. In that sense, an orbital interaction is just a generalized and actually a little bit simpler form of the LCAO method that we can carry out without the help of a computer. So let's do that now. Let's generalize LCAO to a kind of mini LCAO to understand the nature of an orbital interaction, what it looks like both spatially and energetically. An important thing to note about the mini LCAO method is that it's always going to involve two molecular orbitals in, and the same principle applies as applied in the LCAO case. We're going to get two molecular orbitals out, and that influences how we think about the operations of addition and subtraction in the process of setting up the interaction. So let's imagine that we had two orbitals that were close to one another in space. A good example of this is the enolate anion. The enolate anion possesses a non-bonding lone pair adjacent to a pi bond, and we can think about an n to pi star interaction as very nicely spatially allowed in this compound. So let's use this orbital interaction, a non-bonding lone pair to a pi star orbital, as kind of our benchmark example throughout this process. So how would we set this up spatially and energetically? Well, spatially, essentially you're looking at it. So I've drawn the starting non-bonding and pi star orbitals here. And the way we think about the interaction is as either constructive or destructive overlap between adjacent lobes. Here the or orbital overlap is what we call pi type because the interacting lobes are parallel and side by side. When the lobes face one another head on, as in a general sense, something like this, what we're looking at is sigma type orbital overlap, where the interaction is head-on and very strong. Pi-type overlap is a little bit weaker, but for the purposes of discussing mini LCAO, it will work well for us. So to set up an orbital energy diagram for one of these mini LCAO interactions, we still set up the vertical axis as energy, and we still lay down the starting molecular orbitals here, the non-bonding and pi star levels, on the outside of the diagram like so. Constructive overlap as we've seen, lowers the energy of the resulting molecular orbital. So in this case, when we add the two orbitals together, we're going to end up with an orbital that is lower in energy than the starting orbital. Likewise, when we subtract the two, we get destructive interference between the two orbitals, and we'll see an orbital that's higher in energy after subtracting these. Spatially, we can understand what they look like by just imagining what they would look like if they blurred together. So the n plus pi star is going to look something like this. There might be a common lobe between oxygen and the adjacent carbon now, corresponding to one phase, 
and underneath it would have the opposite phase since those are made of two p orbitals. And then the third lobe would be opposite to the large one including oxygen and carbon. So it might look something like this and you can see how our original drawing maps very nicely onto the result of constructive interference. What about in minus pi star? Well in that situation we can simply take the pi star orbital and flip its phase, and when we do that, we end up with destructive interference and, in fact, a node between the n and pi star orbitals, and things might look something like this. In fact, the central lobe has shrunk a little bit because it's feeling destructive interference from both the non-bonding lone pair and the other lobe of the pi star. More important than the shapes, I think, are to understand what happens to the orbital energies upon an orbital interaction. So don't focus too much on the shapes. Instead, let's return to the energies. So recall that constructive interference, when the two are added together, leads to a lower energy orbital, destructive interference to a higher energy orbital, and the electrons that were originally in the higher energy non-bonding orbital are now stabilized relative to where they started out. Notice that the energy has gone down in the course of this orbital interaction. On the other hand, the energy of the unfilled orbital has actually increased as a result of the orbital interaction. But you should also notice in that case as well that stabilization occurs as a result of the orbital interaction. So in both cases, both for the filled and the unfilled orbital, we're seeing stabilization as a result of the orbital interaction. And this is a general property of orbital interactions. They lead to stabilization. In a sense, you can imagine that the orbital interaction is represented by resonance in the Lewis structure. So when a Lewis structure possesses resonance, there's some kind of localized MO interaction that we can think about that helps explain why resonance leads to the stabilization of electrons and unfilled orbitals. A generalized orbital interaction will always look something like this, so it's worthwhile to commit this diagram to memory for any generalized two MOs in, two MOs out interaction. For reasons that will become clear later, filled and unfilled orbitals tend to interact with one another preferentially. And you should notice that this leads to stabilization both of the filled and of the unfilled orbital as a result of the orbital interaction. Another thing to notice about this is that the character of the filled orbital after the interaction, which we find in the middle here, is similar to the character of the starting filled orbital. They're close in energy, therefore we assume that they look similar. Likewise with the unfilled orbital. It's similar in appearance and shape to the unfilled orbital before the interaction or the localized unfilled orbital. To summarize, we basically think of a generalized orbital interaction between two molecular orbitals, or really two orbitals of any type, as constructive and destructive interference to produce two new stabilized molecular orbitals. The shapes of those orbitals reflect the starting MOs to a large degree, but we use these ideas of merging together upon constructive interference and canceling one another out upon destructive interference to think about what these shapes might look like 